The subject of UFOs is a well-known and controversial one, which has some less well-known offshoots. One of these offshoots is the animal mutilation phenomenon. In the 1980s, investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe documented many cases of unexplained animal deaths occurring throughout the United States. Argentina, Australia and Scandinavia are just a few of the regions which have also fallen victim to these bizarre occurrences. What makes the deaths so inexplicable is the types of injuries commonly found on animal carcasses, which include precise surgical cuts and holes in the body, without any spillage of blood at all, missing internal organs, rectal coring, and very commonly a neat piece of skin and flesh removed from the animal's jaw, usually without a cause of death being apparent. Not one person or agency is known to have been seen or caught or convicted for carrying out such attacks. The knee-jerk response of most intelligent-minded people who learn about this phenomenon for the first time is that it is either a satanic cult or a military or government secret project of some kind. These are nice theories, but once you test them against the evidence, they fall short of explaining the phenomenon. On occasions, some of the procedures would be difficult for our own medical professionals to carry out, such as the removal of entire organs from tiny holes. On occasions, complete exsanguination of blood and inexplicable sealed edges around the holes. The phenomenon occurs worldwide, with thousands of cases being reported across many countries. Many different species of animal fall victim, both wild and domestic, including sea creatures and birds. So it's hard to equate the evidence to a government project or a satanic cult. Add to this the fact that UFO sightings are commonplace in areas of mutilation activities. It is obvious why this subject has become inextricably linked to UFOs. Last year I made a film called Silent Killers in collaboration with a group who investigates such cases in the UK called the Animal Pathology Field Unit. They have documented many UK cases, predominantly of sheep. On Sunday the 24th of October 2010 I was alerted to a very recent case in East Sussex of a landowner reporting a mutilated horse exhibiting some of the classic injuries found in cases of animal mutilation. This program follows our investigation into this particular case, which some viewers may find disturbing. They said that a horse had been found at about 9.45 a.m., which belonged to a neighbour. The horse was found in the middle of a field, about 300 yards from their house. A vet and police officer were in attendance, and the matter was being kept low-key. The vet said that she had not seen this kind of attack before and seemed perplexed. The injuries to the horse included a strip of flesh removed from the jaw with damage to the nasal bone and palate, a huge gaping wound on the side of the neck extending to the ear, the ear also being removed. Injuries to the penis and rectum were also present. The chestnuts of the horse had been cut off. I had to ask, what are chestnuts? and the landowner explained they were small, coin-sized lumps just above a horse's knee on the front legs and just below the hock on the hind legs. The police presence had been significantly stepped up and a detective inspector was on the scene, preventing anyone from getting into the field or seeing the horse. About seven police were guarding the entrance to the field. An RSPCA inspector was also on the scene. So off we went setting off from County Durham at 4.40 p.m. with the intention of picking up David Caton from Manchester along the way.
We're travelling down to East Sussex. It's Sunday the 24th of October and this morning at about 11am I received an email from somebody who owns land in East Sussex and there uh, a horse was found with many of the um, classic mutilation injuries. It had a jaw strip, a rectal core and there's no blood on the carcass or on the ground. Um, various other injuries as well. We've been told that the horse is going to be left in the field this evening. Right, we've abducted David from his house <laughs> in Manchester and he's now in the back of the car. We're heading down the M6 now, so I'm very delighted to to tag along because this is very interesting because it looks like being the perfect, uh, certainly modus operandi is, is, is classic. Yeah. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I think the APFU it's the horse, first horse case we've actually come across, you know, first hand. Right. And to have the opportunity to yep. do what we can first thing in the morning before the authorities might whistle the carcass away. Yeah. So. And we've got a range of kits. You've got your Geiger counter, no, your APFU toolbox. Toolbox, yes. Which includes the. Um, yes, the rectal call measuring stick. Right. <laughs> and. So. I've got a tri-field meter with me and uh, another electromagnetic device so we're well kitted up to at least to do some kind of testing yeah, and you've I got your photography our, equipment as well. Some our own images, yes. So it'll be, uh, I hesitate to say, a pleasure to look at this but yeah. um, it has to be done. We arrived at the landowner's property shortly after midnight. They invited us into their home where we discussed the events over tea and biscuits. It became clear immediately that they were aware of similar incidents throughout the world and were keen to help us gather evidence by giving us as much access as we required. We were not entirely sure how long the horse was going to remain within the landowner's custody. We knew of cases in the past where authorities have been expedient in removing animals without any serious investigation. Although by this time it was the dead of night, we decided to get our torches out and walk down the track to the trailer on which the horse had been placed. They've done something with this tooth because that tooth is quite loose. It's damaged. They've, they've, they've not knocked a section off that tooth. Mm -hmm. See, it's been split. Yeah. That's perfect. Look at that. That's been cut. Yeah. I don't know any bother with teeth, but perhaps I was in the way. Yeah. Oh, the tongue, yeah. No, the tongue yeah, looks on top, yeah, the, I can the tongue, see part of the tongue. The tongue looks right. alright to me, but I don't know. We are at the farm um, where the horse was discovered yesterday morning so we're now going to go and have a look in the field where the horse was discovered and also have a look at the horse which has been put onto, onto a trailer. So. Let's get cracking. The surrounding area was very hilly. The field where the horse was discovered the previous morning was on the side of a valley, and because of this was not easily visible from the few houses in the immediate locality. The previous evening the horse had been moved off the field onto a trailer, so was no longer lying where it had been discovered. It took the landowners several minutes to relocate the point where the horse had been discovered. Not a single drop of blood was visible in the vicinity. The landowners supplied some photographs of the horse before it had been moved from the field. The photographs showed clean incisions in the neck and apparently organs removed from the neck, a strip of flesh cleanly and surgically removed from the jaw. It is safe to say from these images alone that this attack was not the work of an animal predator. Some days after the animal was discovered, the story reached national news media, presumably from information given to them by the police. Here are a few quotes from their reports. 
The Daily Mail said police were hunting a maniac who stabbed to death a horse in a frenzied knife attack in a field. Detective Constable Annie Nash from Sussex Police said, We are working closely with the RSPCA to investigate this mindless act of animal cruelty and find those responsible. The Sun said a horse killer who butchered a filly and cut out some of its internal organs was being hunted by cops last night. In addition to the media providing presumptuous comments, a number of internet horse forums were full of condemnation for the people who had perpetrated this crime. When we were at the farm, we spoke to the lady who had been involved with the local riding school and training horses for over 20 years. She was visibly shocked and distressed by what had happened to the horse. She stated that she could not understand why there was no blood and repeated this several times. She explained that in the past, horses that have been cut by barbed wire spill blood everywhere, all over their body, all over the grass, everywhere. She was clearly spooked as to how these injuries, which are massively more serious than a barbed wire cut, could result in not one drop of blood being spilled anywhere.